great panel for you guys right now. <laughs> we are talking all about finding and selling white space. So uh, we have really interesting perspectives from a variety of levels of, of suppliers and some retail. So up, up, up here with me right now is Ryan Blevins, the be beverage director at Taco Mac, which is a sports and beer bar with dozens of locations throughout the Southeast. Hey, Ryan. Hello. Hello. And we also have Veronica Vega. She is the director of new product development at Deschutes, hey. one of the largest craft brewers in the country. Hey. Hi. Hi. <laughs> and this is Sophia Colucci. Hi. Hi. She is the uh, innovation lead at uh, Molson Coors Beverage Company. I'm sure you guys have heard of it. So we have a diversity of size, diversity of location, and we are going to talk all about what is going on. So uh, Danelle and Caitlin just did a really great job telling us uh, all the ways in which Beyond Beer has exploded in the past year, notably seltzer. We're going to try to not make this a seltzer hour, but it's kind of hard to avoid that <laughs> these days. And yeah, so Seltzer, a bound pace to hit $1.5 billion in sales, which is bonkers. The vast majority coming from the top three brands, all of whom belong to uh, companies with really diverse portfolios. So I don't really need to tell you guys who they are, um, but Ryan, I know we've talked a lot about um, Taco Max uh, menu allotments for Seltzer. So what are you hearing from the locations? Are national Seltzer brands ruling the ruling the day? Is anybody interested? Sure. And um, say. So the past three months or so, we've been sort of randomly bringing in these products, um, you know, just kind of spotty, not really mandating anything. But beginning in January, we're actually uh, going to be rolling out a brand new section on our beer menu, pretty prime real estate, right on the front of the menu, dedicated uh, for these type of products, all the seltzers, the quote unquote better for you type products. We're calling it the lighter side. We're rolling it out in January. We feel like it's a good time when everybody's making their health and wellness resolution. So, um, you know, we're, we're rolling the dice a little bit. Uh, we, we are a craft beer domin dominant menu. Um, and so we're just going to carve out a little section on the menu for about 10 to 15 products. And we're going to offer these product, these uh, seltzers and low cal, low ABV, um, better for you beers. Um, as far as national versus local, right now, what you're seeing in our restaurants is mostly national. We're, mm -hmm. we're featuring Bon Aviv right now, the AB uh, seltzer on draft. But uh, it seems like just about every day I'm getting an email from our local guys saying, hey, I've got a new product to show you. And mo more often than not, that new product is a spike seltzer. So I know Sweetwater, if you're familiar with Atlanta brands, uh, Sweetwater's got one coming out with the cannabis-infused terpenes, uh, hard seltzer. Um, Scofflaw, if anybody knows what Scofflaw is, believe it or not, they are jumping in the game. Jeff, I know I think probably you guys are too, I hear. So, uh, so yeah, we, we, we definitely, once the, local, uh, once the local products come in, we want to offer them because we, uh, we have a great partnership with our local people. So. Awesome. Are patrons yeah. asking for them? Or do you um, think there's just not a level of They're curious about them. Cool. Um, we run a lot of data, and that's how we make a lot of our decisions on what goes on a menu. Um, and so they're curious right now. I think what we're seeing and what they showed on their slides is that most of the information is off-premise right now. And we think that's going to translate to on-premise very, very soon. So mm -hmm. Very cool. Very cool. So, Sophia, we learned during Molson Coors' third quarter earnings report that the company's name is getting a bit of a makeover and uh, going to become the Molson Coors beverage company starting next year. So that indicates to me that leadership really thinks that future growth is going to come from outside the traditional definition of beer. Now, you've done a lot. You've spearheaded the rollouts of Movo Wine, Arnold Palmer Canned Cocktails, and Cape Line Canned Cocktails, and a hard coffee co-branded line with uh, La Colombe, which is super cool. So hugely wide array of products. None of them are beer driven. So how does this new strategy affect your team's approach to innovation? And how does the recent announcement of the uh, LA Libations partnership come into play here? How will they help you guys? For sure. I think, well, it is interesting. I really enjoyed, I think it was Tommy yesterday that was talking about just the types of people who are innovating. And I realize I'm not a white dude with a beard. <laughs> and, and the reality is like, I have so much respect for people here who have a ton more knowledge about beer than I do. And I love craft beer, but I also came from, you know, CPG and a lot of health and wellness. And so, and I think it probably reflects then on the pipeline of products that we have. Um, and the reality is we're still a beer company, right? So we are not going to move away from that. And so if you really think about our innovation strategy, there's three big pillars that we're looking at. One is modernizing beer. And that's just really making sure like we've got these amazing brands, including Coors, um, and, uh, 
and just how do we contemporize them and make sure that they are relevant to recruit consumers? So examples of that, you know, we have a lighter blue moon offering coming out called Light Sky. We're super excited about. We have an organic offering on Coors. And obviously we have the St. Archer um, uh, national rollout that's coming out um, in February. So we're really pumped there. Uh, the second strategic pillar is doubling down on flavor. And so, yes, we launched Cape Line, um, but we have to do more in seltzers. We have Henry's, and it's just not enough. Like, the Nielsen presentation just now, it's astounding how big this segment's going to get. So we do have a number of initiatives we're working on, one called Vizzy, um, that has a clear point of difference, which we need at this point coming in. Um, and so we're going to roll out more information on that in the coming weeks. Um, and then the final strategy is this idea of beyond beer. Um, and this is where, like, how do we find those adjacent segments and come in in a relevant way um, that isn't just a me too. So Movo is a great example of that because it's a wine spritzer that has those better for you attributes um, in a really cool package. So we're excited about that. We did some test markets earlier this year and they did phenomenal. So now we're gonna go out national. And then the La Colombe uh, collaboration, um, this was one where we were initially gonna do hard coffee in ourselves. And then we thought, why not partner with someone who has those real coffee credentials? So Janice on my team, she launched that product. And so I think we have it here for you guys to try. Um, but that's just an example of you know, the diversity. And when you think about it, like we are already doing this, um, but we're just gonna go a lot bigger now. So our innovation, uh, you know, we have the biggest innovation pipeline in 2020 than we've had in the last five years. And the uh, revenue that we have coming from innovation in 2020 is double what we have this year. So it, if anything, they're just putting a lot more focus and pressure on it, um, which is exciting for my team. That's really great. Mm -hmm. Really excited to try that hard coffee. Yeah, it's really good. And then the LA libations in terms of non-alc, this is, uh, you know, I'm so excited about this. This is one where, look, like that company, like what they're doing in terms of just the expertise they have in non-alc and this, uh, you, you know, all of the experience they have and better for you, it just makes a lot of sense for us to be partnering with LA Libation. So you can, I think it's the smart move for us to be getting into non-alc. Very cool. You're going to visit them while you're out here? Oh yeah, actually, yes. And I will be seeing them next week too. Nice, nice. Veronica, Deschutes announced Modified Theory during this fall's ABP mm -hmm. cycle. So it's a line of mixology-inspired FMBs. Uh, interestingly, well, I thought it was interesting, build on packaging as a crafted hard bevy, yep. which I thought was adorable. Now, in my old life, I had a coworker who loved to say, hey, let's, you know, go into Sammy's place and get a bevy, which, you know, was appropriate because we had all sorts of things that were not beer. But really cute word. I think it really kind of encapsulates what's happening. So can you tell us about the decision that led to that line in particular and then just the process behind the product because it's fascinating? Yeah, I mean, we were banking on some people like yourself that knew it and have it in their um, verbatim or, you know, the vernacular. But uh, there are a lot of people that don't. And so we want that curiosity and somebody to ask, well, what is a hard bevy? Because... Um, um, you know, and even the, the name modified theory, I mean, I think if I ask anyone in this room what, what you think of, the first words you think of when you hear the word malt beverage, even though we are brewers and beer is a malt beverage, we have ideas. We have theories in our heads about what a malt beverage is. And so this is a malt-based culinary craft, you know, mixology-inspired craft cocktail. And you know, the biggest hurdle for us will be how to communicate that to our consumer. And um, so I think that allowance of a question of what is that and some curiosity, um, I think allows for a conversation on what it is. Very cool. Now, who are you expecting the core drinkers of that line to be? Yeah. So, I mean, Curious people um, interested in, um, you know, that, that like to go to um, bars that have, you know, the, uh, an, an interesting craft cocktail type of menu um, that are intrigued by unique ingredients, but also, you know, we know that people like convenience. People want to crack a can and don't want to be mixing elderflower and all the things that make a beautiful gin cocktail, um, but they want that experience and they want, you know, someone who, to do the hard work for them. So that's what we were thinking um, in, in this line of um, beverages. Very nice. So yesterday we heard a lot of really astute insight from Tommy about what I found what I found most striking was in his address was that innovation might not be the savior that we think it can be. So do you guys think it's possible for brewers to use beyond beer products to introduce new drinkers to their core portfolios? Sophia, why don't we start with you? Uh, yes, <laughs> I do think that. Um, look, like I think 
it has to be a combination of things. So uh, we have a very clear mandate from our marketing team um, that we are all about recruitment. So not just an in innovation, but as we think about just the core marketing we do on like our, you know, the established brands. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, we were focusing probably more on male consumers for a long time. And so I think that some of these things like Movo is a great example. That's like a very female driven product. And I think it's going to help us to get some of those incremental consumers. But I also think that, you know, there's, there's a limit to how big those can be. So I think that it's very incremental, but you're not going to get that same level of scale. And so that's why, you know, I do believe it's important for us to continue to focus on innovation on our core brands as a way to recruit new consumers, but also help to elevate those brands. And so, and, and that's a way to get scale, frankly, as well, too. So for instance, like with Blue Moon Light Sky, what we saw is that it actually helped to bring in new consumers into the portfolio, right? Some people who had maybe left it and who wanted more of that sessionable beer, women as well, too. So I think you just have to be smart about the innovation and recognize, like in some cases, it could be very incremental. In other cases, like, you know, it's kind of a funny saying, but it's like, if you don't, can't, it, you know, people are so worried about cannibalization when it comes to innovation, but if like you don't cannibalize yourself, someone else will cannibalize you. So that's the way we look at it. So that's why we think it's super important to do innovation across, you know, core as well as new brands. Very smart. And do you think there's a way to draw a line from like uh, the Cape Line drinker straight to like, Coors Banquet eventually? Does, does that happen? Or do you think you get them in through one line and then introduce them to the other non-beer products? Uh, that one, probably not. <laughs> um, but And that's okay. Um, but I do think, for instance, like, um, you know, a good example would be um, on the Movo wine spritzers we're coming out with. Like, I think what's going to happen is, like, you're seeing a lot of these hard seltzer drinkers. And in many cases, you know, we saw earlier, like, they do skew younger. And I think what's going to happen is that there's going to be an evolution. And, you know, as people age, they say, hey, I'm interested in wine. And then they're going to start to, and like, for instance, like Movo is an example of a product that is even more premium than a hard seltzer. So they have a little bit more disposable income. So I think that in some cases, there is a natural progression. Very cool. What about for you? Yeah, guys? a little yeah, build on that. I mean, we talk a lot at the brewery about the difference between innovation and iteration and with our, with, within our craft beer uh, uh, new items. I mean, sometimes, honestly, those are iterations, right? A brew IPA is an iteration of an IPA. Is that truly innovation? Are you bringing in a new customer? Are you broadening your reach? And so with something like Modified Theory, we truly want to make it a separate brand so that Deschutes Brewery, um, that, that brewery connection isn't there because people have self-identified as I don't drink beer because they have either an IPA or a lager in their head. Um, and, and that is already, that's a barrier, right? So by, by putting something out like Modified Theory, um, we see that as true innovation, that's white space. You know, people are looking at the seltzer category. There's, you know, that jump between what's happening in seltzers, all these kind of like flavored beverages, and then the um, canned spirits with true spirits. There's that, that hole there that we are looking to fill. Um, we'll bring those drinkers in and, and bring them also into our craft company, I, you know, like we might not convert them into an IPA drinker, but we will bring them into our tasting room and, and bring, you know, our values as a craft company um, to them and hopefully just offer them something that we didn't offer them before. Very cool. Now, how connected are the two brands going to be in terms of like packaging, POS, marketing, communications? Very separate. Very and, separate. And, and that's the first time we're really doing that at a, at a big scale. So um, it's been a great opportunity to learn how to build a good go-to-market strategy for our sales team on, you know, Know, representing two separate brands. Uh, we're proud to make it. We will be serving it at our pubs, and, um, and, but from a consumer-facing message, they're completely separate brands. Very cool. Thank you. Now, Ryan, what are you guys seeing in terms of like, what people are consuming per visit? Like, Do you find people skipping around, a little of this, a little of that, start with a beer, and then you know, step down to a seltzer? <clears throat> well, one thing that we... Um sort of have in our favor is a, a loyalty program we call Brew University. I'm going to pitch it right now, but uh, it, it basically rewards you to drink different beers. So that if you want to advance in the program, you can't just sit there and pull the same handle. So you have to. We, we encourage exploration on our menu. We have over 100 draft lines in all of our restaurants. So there's plenty of beers to explore or products to explore. So what we see and we encourage is for people to try other things. And so sign up for our program, try other products, and that way you get familiar with uh, different brands and different products. Um, a good example is we have a beer of the month program, and for the first time in 40 years, we are putting 
uh, Beyond Beer products menu as part of the Beer of the Month program. So this local brewery called Dry County is also making a, a, a bottled Old Fashioned and also a, a craft or a draft cocktail. It's a blueberry lemonade cocktail. So for the, like I said, like the first time in 40 years, we're putting Beyond Beer products on our menu and showcasing them. Um, and some of the purists don't like that, but uh, we, we understand that the times are changing and uh, we, our menu has to change with the times. So. You're going to call it the beverage of the month? Perhaps? It might be, <laughs> yeah, the beverage company of the month or there something. You go. Yeah. Very cool. So sometimes I think we all know that most new ideas and new products just don't work out. Uh, it's just kind of the nature of the beast. And if you're not trying, you're definitely not going to get anywhere. But how long do you guys give new ideas, new products time to, to test out and grow and stretch and see if they're viable before you decide to pull the plug? Ryan, why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, we give, we'd like to give our products, new products, time. I mean, we don't want to do them justice, right? It's, it's, it's kind of our duty to make sure they have enough time to perform and that our consumer knows that they're there. But ultimately, if, if the time is up, and um, it's basically a performance database decision, if we pull the numbers and there's no uh, numbers to show good performance, then we do have to make that decision to pull them off and try something else. So. Okay, like how long do you guys let a product kind of hang yeah, out? Yeah, I mean, we, pipeline? we still utilize our pubs and tasting rooms as those, um, you know, as those labs. Um, and we give, I think, them more time and maybe try a new name, try to market it in a different way, uh, maybe two or three years and um, see if it bubbles up to the top five seller at either pub. Um, see if the employees, you know, your employees are a great voice in, in letting you know when something is a winner. Um, out in the market, if you put all that effort into launch, um, I mean, it's Within a year, you have. If you're looking at your 60-day, 120-day, um, you know Nielsen and VIP data, you have a pretty good idea of, of, you know, did you build the momentum to continue to build the brand? So sometimes the writing is on the wall, um, but with that much effort, you know, you, you have to balance. Do you cut something off and just, you know? layer something over it for the next year. We usually have a big product pipeline so that we can make those calls. But um, um, typically for us, um, we look at those numbers, but also can we keep it fresh in the market? So, you know, that's a big driver. We will make it until we can keep it fresh. Very cool. What about for you guys? Yeah, I mean, candidly, sometimes it's not up to us. It's up to our customers and how willing they're, like, they are to keep it on shelf. Um, I, so what I would say is like, typically it is about a year, but even within three months, you can get a good understanding of how something is performing and then whether our distributors and our customers are going to support it. What I would say is given this, what I'm really trying to push for us in terms of our approach on innovation is how do we balance scale along with test and learns? And so what we are doing a lot more of now is getting products into three markets and testing it out there. And then it's just, it's a much more calculated risk, right? It takes that pressure away from ensure like everything has to be like a guaranteed success. So, you know, we did that, we're doing that with Movo. We did that with, um, with La Cologne. We did it with St. Archer in a few markets. We've got an expansion in Arnold Palmer, Palmer. And, you know, next year I wanna have like double the amount of tests and learns because I think it does kind of take that pressure off and then it allows us to be able to maybe take a few big bets on some other things um, because not everything is gonna work out. That's just the way it is with innovation. Very cool. So we're starting to get some good questions come in. So if you have them, fire them up. I can see them right here. Um, so question, so uh, Ryan, what does Taco Mac think is the most likely path to success for seltzer in on-premise channels? Uh, you're gonna do packaged flavors, draft, draft unflavored? I think for us, um, we're gonna find success in draft and flavors. Right now, what we're seeing, uh, the Bon Aviv, for example, that we're featuring is just kind of the classic flat um, flavor, if you will. Um, but we are seeing consumers add a shot of vodka in it or a pump of a squirt of syrup of some sort to flavor it themselves, or maybe just even a squeeze of lime or lemon. But I think for us, what, we, what we're gonna see success in is flavors and, and local, really. I mean, I know that um, local is real big for us and our consumer and our people like to drink local. Um, and so tapping into the local draft flavors, I think those three combinations will be successful. Very cool. Yeah. So how do you decide how many flavors is the right number? I know we saw uh, like a Truly slide yesterday that had like, I think like 47 canned flavors in there. How do you decide how many to offer? That's a great question. I think we're so, 
um, new in this endeavor that we don't have that answer yet. So we'll start, like I said, on this lighter side menu that we're rolling out. Um, we're sort of mandating that the restaurant carries 10 to 15 products. Um, some of them are kind of hard mandates, some are the, you know, the bar manager's choice. So we'll start there. And then um, if we see that there's a want or need for more flavors and more options, then we'll just keep growing that category and that, that, that section of our menu. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so a question that's really for all three of you. Um, I'm going to read it directly because it's a lovely compliment. Started with Ryan. You are encouraging people to explore, and that's awesome. <laughs> what vehicles do you use to get feedback on product besides just velocity? So obviously, all three of you need that information. So what, what ways are you, you know, weighing that? Um, for us, um, our consumer is very vocal, especially our Bruniversity members. Uh, they're very, they're real loyalists, and they're in our restaurants quite often. So they're, they, they, uh, they have no problem speaking up, uh, whether it's directly with a phone call, text, or we do also have kind of a comment line on our receipts, like many other uh, brands do, where you can do people send an email. actually use that. Yes. Wow. Oh gosh, yes. You would not believe. Yes. I mean, I do. suppose if there's a way a beer drinker can give you their opinion, they're, oh, yeah, they're, they're going to use They want to be heard. So. That's, that's the vehicle for some. <laughs> yeah. Where yeah. You so, go? you know, like I said, our pubs are a great place. I mean, our pub customers, when you said that, it's like, oh, man, yep. they tell us when they like something, when they don't like something. We make a more concerted effort with some actual tastings that have questions that we want answered um, on flavor direction. Are we going in the right track? For something like Modified Theory that was such a you know, break from our you know, day-to-day -day, um, um, beer, um, there, we went out and had some focus groups. Um, we did qualitative, quantitative research and really validated our own gut feelings because we all like th think we might know who the FMB drinker is and um, what they care about. Um, but it was so important that we didn't want to go with hunches. So we actually did some more um, um, focus group and, and research. And I think that is something like a, a maturity level in the craft beer industry that we're getting to. I mean, man, back in the day, we would just you know, let's, let's see how it goes at the pub. And, and, and we just don't have the time to do that. We need to be putting in some um, analytics and, and getting some insights from consumers. Yeah. Well, and your pub, you know, your pub customers are self-selecting. They, they know your brand. They like your brand. They want to be there. So. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So cool. Sophie, what do you guys do? Yeah, I mean, look, we're obviously a big company and like we launch things with scale. And what I would say from an insights perspective and learning, what I am really proud of is that we're finding a nice balance of really scrappy testing as well as, you know, more the traditional Nielsen testing that we do, which is still super helpful. So, uh, you know, it's a combination. So, I, like, when we launched Light Sky, we did it in our Blue Moon tap room, and we actually, you know, surveyed consumers and had iPads and were able to get feedback right away. Um, even with La Colombe right now, in the launch, in the test market, we actually have like a little survey inside and consumers can, you know, get some money but by responding into questions. And so those are just some of the new things, but we, we have a, you know, a proprietary panel of 10,000 consumers online and we can get questions and answers from them within 24 hours. And so that's been super helpful. And then look, like I'm a psycho on, on social media. <laughs> like I will go to our, our uh, Instagram or Facebook Facebook um, pages and look at consumer responses. And that's dangerous, but at the same time, like when you're launching a product, it's a good indicator of just sometimes like maybe where some of the heat or the tension could be. It's not always foolproof or perfect. And sometimes your boss will send you a text in the middle of the night because she was looking at it. But in general, what I would say is, you know, you have to just like take uh, pulses from all different parts where you can. Very cool. Great question that came through. Uh, how do you truly identify what consumers need and want? So can you guys walk us through the process and resources typically used? Because I think a lot of times these products are something that the consumer hasn't even thought of. If you told somebody in 2012, hey, we're going to make a water and it's going to get you drunk, they would have thought that we were all nuts. So Yeah, I mean, I can, I can talk about just uh, our evolution at Deschutes. I mean, we made beers that the brewers were excited to make. We made, um, like, it was very, it was driven by the hospitality, the pub piece, and we have to change. Um, and so by our strategic statement changing to be a beverage company, it's bringing in that like kind of business maturity in looking at macro trends. I mean, if you think of the seltzers, like LaCroix told us many, many years before, you know, White Claw, that consumers were going in that direction. So if you're not looking at the broader, like the what's moving people, like their need for transparency, like currently, uh, uh, you know, 
the ingredients that they're gravitating towards, if you're not looking at, at the macro level and then fun, funneling it down into food and beverage, what's moving people in food and beverage, and then getting into craft, um, that's where we start whittling down something that we're not waiting for someone to ask. And, we'll, and then we have that test forum on. We think this is something that someone would want, and we have the pubs to test that. Very cool. How about you? Guys? Yeah, no, I 100% I agree with that. Like, non elk is a great indicator of things that are going to happen in alcohol. Um, and clearly, like we've seen it with hard seltzers, we took a gamble with coffee because we were seeing this explosion in cold brew coffee. Um, and then, yes, like we're looking at overall macro trends, um, better for you, premiumization. And yeah, like when it comes down to it, consumers aren't going to tell us, like even canned wine is a great example of that. You know, I had when I came in, I thought, hey, I want to get into this. And we did exploratory work. And in the past, like we would pay some agencies a lot of money and they would spend time with consumers and come up with hypotheses. And the reality is at the time, there was a lot of consumers who, because canned wine was still relatively new, were sitting there telling us like, oh, canned wine, that feels cheap. But when you actually start to put together a proposition that you think could make sense for that occasion, so knowing that they want sessionable products, knowing that better for you is something important. All of a sudden, when we actually, you know, used our own intuition and thought about what was happening on a broader scale and then presented this proposition with Movo, which is 100 calories, no sugar added, sessionable, consumers liked it. So I think you just have to be careful sometimes when you, you know, start probing consumers. They're not going to tell you exactly what they want. You have to put together more of a proposition, um, and then that'll be easier for them to react to. Very cool. Uh, great question for Ryan from James. Do you think it would be wise for local brands with cult followings to highlight seltzers under the same flag or take a similar approach and create a, create a standalone brand? Hmm. Um, I think it can work both ways. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm just drawing upon examples that are in the market now. Well, so we see, you know, we truly is its own brand, yes. but now we're going to have Bud Light Seltzer. So uh, I think standalone would be my decision. Yeah. If I were a local um, brand, I think differentiating yourself, like we heard yesterday, is important. Um, but I also think that there is some importance to really sh um, tell who you are and, and not be so different. So it's sort of a... a a different answer, a conflicting answer, but I think uh, differentiation is important. Very cool. Yeah. So with all of these new flavors, um, seltzer flavors, FMB beverages, is there any concern about staining draft lines? I do know in my old life, we had a blackberry beer on last summer and the line tasted like blackberry for like six weeks. There is a concern for sure. And uh, that's something we got to handle internally with our with our wholesalers and with our, you know, our draft line cleaning companies. And so mm -hmm. there is definitely a concern, yeah. yeah. Makes sense. Uh, Sophia, what does Molson think that some, like on what occasion is somebody going to drink hard coffee? Yeah, that is the question that I'm getting all the time. <laughs> um, so frankly, we're, we don't know yet too well, but what we have seen is it's in those moments when people want a little pick me up. And so, you know, I'm sure you guys are familiar with like vodka Red Bulls. And so we look at this as like the more sophisticated pick me up. And so we actually, our tagline is rally like a grown up because it's more of a sophisticated rally. And, uh, and a great example of this actually, and I'll use like a personal experience myself. Um, I don't know how many people here have kids. I have a four and a three year old. And sometimes I make a mistake of having plans on a Friday night and I'm exhausted after a long week of work and I come home and you know we put the kids to bed and we have 15 minutes to get ready to go out and so typically like I'll be making myself an espresso and then my husband will be pouring me a drink so this is just one of those drinks <laughs> that you know is a perfect solution so that in in, in fact actually um, when we have been surveying consumers um, that's one of the questions we're getting we're asking them and we're seeing it's definitely in those pick-me-up occasions brunches tailgates you know after work when people are going out so but it is still new, right? And so, and I think that the key here too is it's not super high in caffeine. It has like 50 milligrams of coffee, which is about half a cup of coffee or a shot of espresso, which is what people wanted. Like this is not a four loco. Like this is, uh, this is again, it's a sophisticated pick me up. That's funny. So I'm from the Jersey Shore, so I am no stranger to the RBVs. <laughs> and I have uh, two younger brothers who are far cooler than I, and that's always kind of who I look to in my old life when I was thinking, like, does this, you know, campaign make sense? This, you know, whatever we're doing, a promotion, would they like it? And when we're all, you know, home at our mom's before we get ready to go out, they brew a big pot of coffee. So <laughs> There you go. That's how you know we're old. <laughs> 
Uh, is there uh, ever an issue of being too early to market? Can that be a problem? Yeah. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, and that has example, happened. But, like, yeah. even, you know, we've, we've talked about it. Like, oh, we were too early for our own good. Again, that's where I would say, that's why it's like, especially if you're going into these emerging spaces, the more you can manage the risk and, you know, launch in a couple of markets and really test it out, the better, right? Because then you can get a good read, you can understand what's working, you can make tweaks to the proposition um, versus trying to go big and you just weren't ready for it. Very cool. Well, guys, that's it. I think we're about out of time. This was an awesome conversation. Thank you guys so much for putting up with me for Thank the first you. time. And uh, how about a hand for these guys? Thank you.